Good morning or afternoon if you're somewhere else apart from Australia. It's 10 a.m. here at Brisbane time in Australia and I am in the beautiful 1770 again because my reception is so good here in the beautiful 1770. It's still uh, school holidays in some states in Australia so if you hear some kids screaming in the background I'll just turn you around so you can see what I can see here. There's kids swimming at the beach. Anyway, they're having a lovely time, so you might hear them. Um, anyway, I am finally back from Rome, which was fantastic, I have to say. The conference was so good, and I think most of you have been following bits of that um, on Facebook. I did a lot of Facebook Live interviews, both with the um, presenters and the speakers at the conference, as well as some of the audience and stuff, just so we could get an idea of why people went to the conference and what they were getting out of it. It really was a fabulous spot. And I have the proceedings here. I've put a link in the um, comments section there, which is a link to the equitationscience.com site. And that will get you to all of the other um, proceedings. This one is the, the 14th conference this year, um, but 1 to 13, you can download the proceedings there. And what that will give you, as you can see in this, is each page is a different abstract. Now, when I recently surveyed people about what it was that they wanted, that they were finding difficult with their horsemanship and um, with their horse training and just generally um, with owning horses and training horses, one of the big things that came up was the lack of access to peer-reviewed material. Now, there are, I think, a hundred and there are over a hundred, um, how many are there? Oh, I should have counted this before, shouldn't I? Um, let me see. Um, okay, so there are 33 oral presentations and then there are a whole lot of posters as well. So all of those are in here. Um, here, posters. Yeah, so I, overall there's over 100 peer-reviewed abstracts in here. So what the abstract does is it just gives you an overview of what's happened. So it'll it'll tell you um, any significant findings that, that were found. It'll give you the sort of values for those findings. But because it's peer-reviewed, it means it's already gone to a panel of experts in the field and they've already said whether or not it's good science, you know, so whether or not you should, you know, it's worth reading. So they've decided that all of this is, that's, they passed the peer review process. So it's really worth going to check out those um, proceedings. And I will put a link to this year's, the 14th, um, in the blog post when I download the replay of this webinar for people that couldn't make it, uh, there'll be a link there as well. So you can download your own copy of these proceedings. Um, now, the interesting thing about these conferences is that it's always new material. So what they like to have at these conferences is material that's not been published before, which is fascinating because we get to see all the stuff that we, is really new science, which is really wonderful and, and just makes it so interesting. I really recommend if you possibly can to attend one of these conferences. They usually run for three or four days. This time we ran for three days of talks and then the fourth day was the practical day where you get the horses out and do stuff with the horses which was also really good. Um, but the first three days is you know we run through the different um, abstracts that we're discussing and you get a chance to actually speak to the scientists themselves and speak to other members of the audience there and um, really learn a lot about what's happening in equitation science. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's interesting to see who attends these conferences. It's a great networking place. So you'll find that, yes, as the academics and the researchers are all there, 
and so are the professionals you know lots of vets and lots of um people from different welfare societies are there as well and a lot of practitioners you get the coaches and the trainers and those sorts of people all go along as well as well as just your enthusiasts you know people that love horses breed horses own horses ride horses the whole spectrum is there and it's a great opportunity to really talk to those people that you've perhaps read about or perhaps you know watched on youtube or you know you use their material or something but you've never actually met them it's a great opportunity to go and do that and that's why i did those little interviews for you which you can find on facebook if you just go along to the candle equine facebook page you'll see i did a whole lot of short interviews where i talked to people like Andrew McLean and um, people like that that you know some of us haven't met but we chatted about Pony Club and various things so it was really fun to do those interviews there's some really interesting people involved in equitation science these days so today what I want to do is I want to just take you through some of these that I've marked to discuss um, and I'll just have a little chat about you know what my major takeaways were from those various um, presentations. Of course, the first one I have marked up here is the very first thing up on the agenda, which was my workshop, um, which was a workshop, not a presentation. So that was um, 45 minutes long. Um, and it's called Building Bridges Between Theory and Practice, how the equine assessment and research questionnaire um, brings researchers and practitioners together. So what this is, this is about eBark, which is my PhD project, and that is all about exactly this, bringing practice and um, research together. So what we did in this workshop was we looked quickly at um, what eBark's about, and then we also looked at building the, what, we're, what I'm calling the exit survey. So eBark is a uh, longitudinal um, sort of tool to collect data on horse management, training and behavior. And to find out more about eBark, you can just go to my website and uh, www.canduequine.com. And on the top navigation there, you'll see one that says eBark. Let's click on that. I've actually made a little video of the presentation that I did for this workshop in Rome. You can go along and watch that. It's only, you know, 30 minutes long or something. And it tells you about eBark, about where we're going with eBark, um, and about the importance of the exit survey, which is what the workshop was about. We were building the exit survey. So what that means is you can do an eBark with your horse every six months. Um, so let's say you, you do one and then you sell the horse. So if you then get a notification, you know, six months later to do another eBark, you can go in and you can tell us why you sold the horse and how you sold the horse and where the horse went and all of that sort of thing. Because in this industry, you know, wastage is a big problem. You know, horses get sold for different reasons. We don't have much information on why that is. So if we find that a lot of horses are being sold for behavioral reasons, which we suspect is true, there might be something we can do in the training and management of those horses that prevents that from happening. You know, there might be improvements we can make that really improve the welfare of the horse in the long term, but we won't know that until we've done this research. So that's really what eBark is all about. So do go and have a look at that and watch that. We've got some very exciting news about eBark coming up soon, and we're going to actually be launching eBark um, with a lot of incentives, which you can find out about um, in that presentation as well but we're going to be launching it um, in the week before Christmas so watch out around the 18th of December and I'm telling you that early so we make sure you get in and take full advantage of that the the other thing they do at these um, conferences is they have um, plenary speakers which are always you know really interesting so this particular conference they they called it all what was it all about um good good behavior good management good training um and good housing and things so they had a lot of discussion um about 
those things are good welfare. They have discussions about welfare and things. So the first one um, was a very interesting um, speech about which they call the Clever Hands Lecture. So every year they're going to do another one, a Clever Hands Lecture, which is which is really interesting. And um, for those of you that don't know about Clever Hands, Clever Hands was a horse that was supposed to be able to count and do really quite complicated maths problems. And what was happening was he this oh, the owner was taking the horse around and he'd show him that he could train this horse to do these maths problems. And he'd state the problem and the horse would count out the answer, you know, by tapping on the board with its foot. And what this was well believed, you know, over a long period of time. And then eventually they found out that the horse was picking up some really subtle cues that the trainer was giving the horse. And the trainer wasn't meaning to do that at all. Um, but there were just some subtle cues that the horse was picking up that the trainer didn't realise they were giving. And so what happened was, you know, we were actually attributing these things to this horse that the horse wasn't doing. So we were really misinterpreting what was going on with the horse, which is, you know, that can be really bad when we're training because what happens then if we assume that the horse knows something, we assume that the horse can do algebra, then when the horse can't do algebra, we get really upset with the horse. And so it does lead you down this, you know, questionable welfare road. Um, and a lot of the first things were, were about that. And one of the ones that I want to talk to you about, first of all, because um, we put this up on the Facebook page last night. I'm actually also the media officer for the International Society for Equitation Science. So we do press releases about a, a few of the you know most interesting talks here um, at the conference. And the first one from um, it wasn't the first sorry it wasn't the first press release. It was the, the second one we discussed. But it was a very important piece, and it's this one here, and it's called um, horse communication. What does non-nutritive chewing mean? So, you know, this is when the horse licks and chews, but it's not eating. And it was very interesting because um, we put it up last night on the Facebook page and, you know, already sort of 12 hours later, it's had um, over 300 likes and 300 and I think 400 shares. And so people are very interested in this and it, you know, it came from a student, which was also really nice. It was really nice to see that student presenting that work. Um, and it, the, I did interview that student, um, so you can find that on the Facebook page as well. But the work was really interesting because it's often assumed when a horse licks and chews that it a number of things. Firstly, a lot of people assume that it means the horse is being submissive. And that I've been told that over and over again, you know, from people that say, oh, the horse is licking and chewing. That means what the horse is telling you that it's not a threat to you, um, that it's a grazing animal, um, that, you know, it's a submissive thing. So that's a good thing because it means that you've, you know, you're, you're the herd leader now. And so it's a really important sign. Um, you hear that a lot, people using the round pen. Um, the other thing that people say it means is that it means the horse has absorbed the lesson. So the licking and chewing indicates that the horse is thinking that over, mulling it over, um, and that you're doing a good job of teaching it because the horse is absorbing that information. But this study here shows that neither of those things are correct. So what this says to us, and the very interesting study, because they actually used feral horses. So what they would do, I'm just trying to quickly find how many horses they used. They had a, they had a herd of feral horses, um, and um, I can't see quickly, but they, they had 100 counter behaviour, 128 before, 16 chewing. So what they did was they just observed these feral horses and when they counted the number of times that chewing and licking behaviour was showing. So they were looking to see whether it did indicate submission. And they did this by saying, well, when one horse gets another horse to move, 
the horse that moves must be the submissive horse and the horse that moves it must be the dominant horse. So you would expect then that the submissive horse would move and lick and chew at the same time. They didn't find that at all. They found that both horses licked and chewed. Um, so the uh, dominant horse was doing just as much or more, I think. I have to read that a bit more carefully. Licking and chewing as a submissive horse. So clearly it, it wasn't a sign of submission. Um, the other thing, they, what they did end up concluding was that actually what it was, it was a, a change in the horse's um, emotional state. So the horse was getting stressed and then when it was less stressed, it started to lick and chew. So this, you know, this stress is a, is a funny and overused word and it's not terribly helpful because it, it doesn't really define much. So, um, and these were feral horses, so these horses haven't been touched. So we can't put a heart rate monitor on these horses. We can't take cortisol levels from these horses. This is just a first, this is a preliminary look at this. What we need to do now is take that further. So what it means is the horse has been stressed and then it comes out of that. The behaviour, the licking and chewing behaviour doesn't seem to last very long and it seems to indicate the horse is now less stressed than it was so for training purposes i think this is really important information mostly because what it's saying is that um you've caused the horse some stress and now the horse is feeling a bit better so that doesn't mean that the horse understands the lesson any better it doesn't mean that the horse is being submissive it simply means the horse is less stressed than it was a moment ago um, and somebody said to me this morning, oh, that's bad then because, you know, my horse licks and chews at times, you know, and you've told us we need to raise the emotional level and is that stressing the horse and all of these sorts of things. And this is why this science is so interesting because you take a little study like this and then it opens up all these different possibilities and all these new questions. You know, good science leads to more questions than answers, of course. And it's absolutely fascinating to see this because the questions that are coming out now are, are really interesting. And I've been saying for a long time, you know, I talk about the engagement zone and that's that place, that emotional level where the horse is more emotional than it would be if it was standing and resting, but less emotional than it would be if it was anxious or frightened. And there's this nice level in there, which I found in an experiment I did to be sort of between 10 and 16% above resting. And that was me taking um, heart rate and heart rate variability. So that's actually you know, been tested. That's where the horses were learning the best and that's where the horses were tossing their heads less. So, you know, that's, that's worth knowing, but that's, you know, that's also not conclusive. So what we need to do is we need to actually define that. We know that if the horse is sort of snoozing, that it's not emotional enough to be learning. We know we have to engage the horse. So that does mean making the horse slightly more emotional than it is when it's resting, but not so emotional that it's scared. So if you think about a horse in a round pen and you're chasing that horse and then suddenly you stop chasing the horse, then its emotional level is going to come down and it will probably start to lick and chew because, you know, that is quite stressful being chased. Um, but if you take that as a good sign, um, then you're sort of missing the point that the horse, you know, um, might have been way too emotional. You know, you haven't measured that how much you've raised that emotional level. So you can't just say that it's a good thing at all. What we need to do is find out where that place is. And I would say that it would differ for individual horses. I think that's something worth noting is that not all horses are going to be the same because some horses start they naturally have a higher emotional level than others and I think training is all about being able to control that emotional level a bit so being able to lift it a bit and lower it a bit and lift it a bit and lower it a bit as we all know you know that's the way we learn it doesn't necessarily mean it's the way horses learn but it's certainly what I've found is that being able to lift the emotional level a bit and then say to the horse right you know explain something clearly to the horse and then say 
offer it the opportunity to relax again and then lift it again and relax again. Rather than just sort of lifting it, having you go through the whole lesson and, you know, come out the other end and goes, oh, thank God that's finished. You know, what we want to do is have these sorts of things where the horse is a little more emotional and relaxes, a little more emotional, so it's engaged and relaxed, engaged and relaxed all the way through the lesson to keep the horse interested in what you're doing. Yeah. And so I think this sort of research um, about the looking and chewing is absolutely fascinating because it opens all these doors. And you know, it's great to know that it's not about submission, which also fits in really well with the International Society for Equitation Science um, position statement on dominance theory which you should go and read if you haven't already. I might put another link to that in the blog post when I download the replay of this webinar for you so you can have a look at that. It is very important. And the, the reason that this dominance theory is so damaging to horse welfare is because it allows us to make assumptions about what's going on in the horse's head. So if we assume that... Um, a horse that's disobeying our commands is being disrespectful um, and that we need to make ourselves the herd leader, we're much more likely to punish that horse. And by punish, I mean, I simply mean how you time your reinforcement or punishment schedule schedule so let's say the horse um let's say you've got the horse in the round pen and you've asked the horse to turn and the horse doesn't turn if you then make the horse run a little bit faster that's punishing the horse now you don't have to go and hit the horse with a stick it's all about timing so uh, um, it's my phone. <laughs> um so the thing is it's about timing so if I do it after the horse has done the thing and I want it, I want that to be, behavior to be less likely to occur in the future, then that's punishment. So the same cue or the same um, response to a behavior can be either neg negative um, reinforcement or it can be punishment or it can be positive reinforcement. So if it's, let's say we're adding something, so positive reinforcement, we add something the horse wants. Positive punishment, we add something the horse doesn't want. So let's say the horse, we want the horse to stand still, okay? We want the horse to stand still and the horse steps forward. If we then tap the horse on the um, cannon bone with the whip to get it to step back, that's punishment. It's not saying we're hurting the horse, that's just what we call it because we added something, it's positive punishment, we added something, that was the tap with the whip, and it was done to make that behavior, stepping forward, less likely to occur in the future. Now the problem with punishment like that is that it's on this sliding scale from correction, tapping the horse on the cannon bone with the whip, to punishment, and some people might think whacking the horse on the cannon bone with a stick. So but there's no guidelines to tell us which is which. You know, how do we know? So for me, a correction might be to, to tap the horse like this. And for you, you know, the same correction might be to absolutely wallop the horse. You know, who knows? There, there's no definition of it. The only way we can define whether it's um, reinforcement or punishment is the reason it's done. So it is done to stop the behavior happening in the future or it's done to make the behavior more likely to happen in the future is the only thing that can tell you whether it's reinforcement or punishment. And we know that punishment doesn't work that well with horses. We just know that. So the more we can avoid using punishment, the better our training is going to be and the more ethical and the better for the horse welfare. So it is very important. And what happens when we make assumptions like we do often about licking and chewing and dominance and things like that is that it leads us down that road of punishment because it allows us to make assumptions about what the horse is thinking and quite often they're not right and quite often they do lead us down that terrible road you know if you've ever heard someone say a stupid horse he knows what I want him to do he's just being stubborn or he just doesn't want to do it or he's disrespectful all of those things lead us really 
quickly down that path. And that's why this little piece of work in here was so interesting. So that was the first one I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, another really good one, which you'll, anyone that trains with me is going to really enjoy this, is um, number three, horses learning performance when using different training schedules daily versus every three days training sessions to train novel tasks via negative reinforcement. Um, there we are. You'll find that on, on page 30. That's great. I love this one. They, they train the horses either every day or once every three days. Now, I'm always saying, you know, it's quality, not quantity. And I'm always saying, you know, your horse, even when you're starting it, shouldn't be breaking down the sweat and if you can do 15 minutes work three times a week you're so much better off than doing one hour you know every day of the week <laughs> um this little piece of work made a really good start on showing us that that is actually the case and they were teaching novel objects so something the horse no sorry they were teaching a novel task so something the horse didn't already know but what was interesting is they were there are 20 horses, so that's a good number of horses, various ages, between 2 and 24. And they were only spending a couple of minutes a day teaching this. So it was really interesting because they found that actually it didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference if you taught it every day or if you did it once every three days. And I think that's fascinating. Um, and it certainly backs up what I've found personally. And that's what I do tell people all the time, you know, a few minutes, a few good minutes, a few good repetitions is so much better than 30 minutes or an hour of ordinary repetitions. You know, it really is. Horses get really bored when you repeat and repeat and repeat. They do. So, you know, the shorter you can make it, the better your repetitions, the more you can engage your horse with learning, like raise its emotional level just enough to engage it, but not too much. Keep it in that engagement zone. The more effective your training is going to be. And I think it's great news for young horses as well, those horses being started, because young horses even more so you know they just don't have the concentration they don't have the mental capacity to concentrate for the amount of time that a lot of people expect them to um, they also don't have the physical capability of doing that without being hurt and it's a big thing you know we've talked here before about you know back from the breakers and backing up bronco that was one of the webinar topics that we did and that was all about that you know you quite often will get breakers uh, taking horses on and they say oh, I guarantee I'll ride it for an hour a day and I'm thinking that's awful you know how can you do that to a horse that's never had a rider on it before so it's going for you know from nothing to after a week or two being ridden for an hour a day it's completely unacceptable and the horse is going to hurt absolutely for sure there's no way you're going to be able to do that you're not going to be able to build the muscle in that horse in time in, in a week to be able to get it ready even if you set out to do so which most people don't either because they don't long range so they're not working the horse in frame in fact they sit on the horse with its head in the air and a hollow back and usually in a saddle it doesn't fit and you know it's a disaster and what they're trying to do is they're trying to get miles under the belt the miles under the belt do not educate the horse they make the horse fit they tire the horse out but honestly that is no way of doing it what you want to do is you want to break lessons down enough to really educate the horse so it has that foundation there and you can do that by taking it in little chunks and explaining it to the horse and then building on those little chunks of information. There's no reason to tire your horse out. There's absolutely no reason to get your horse that fit either because, you know, I mean, what's more dangerous than an unfit, uneducated horse? And the answer to that is a fit, uneducated horse. So that, that was a really good one too. I've just got a couple more I'd like to point out. Um, and this was an interesting one. Um, this is on page 33, and it's called The Effect of Separation on Equine Behaviour, Heart Rate, Heart Rate Variability, Whilst on a Horse Walker. Now, this was, this was very interesting because what it does is it shows you 
how you can't sort of jump to conclusions immediately just because of one little piece of work. You know, science isn't like that. You, this is a this sort of study was a good start, but now we need to find out really what's going on because what happened here was this person did an interesting little study on um, horses' heart rates and when they were put on the horse walker and the they were going to see whether or not they were finding the separation difficult. So, you know, it's it's a good question because if you put a a horse on a horse walker alone then it is much more likely to be stressed and they did find that not surprisingly um, and they also found that you know if the best way to do it would be to put it on with another horse and preferably a horse that it likes a horse that it gets on with so I thought that was important um, so it wasn't surprising what was surprising though was some of the heart rate um, measurements that came back so really really high now which would indicate that the horse was you know extremely stressed um and that's sort of unlikely to happen really i mean unless the horse you know is also showing some other signs that it was extremely stressed and what somebody at the conference pointed out was that they were using polar heart rate monitors and they do have some errors associated with them. It's quite easy to get them to do really high readings. And so a better thing to use would be um, an ECG. And so, you know, this is why these conferences are so good because other researchers can stand up and say, oh, well, you know, maybe if you did the same experiment with an ECG, you wouldn't get quite such high heart rates and maybe those horses aren't quite as stressed as we think they are just looking at this initial study and so we can go off and you know do that because that would be really interesting just to make sure that those horses aren't as stressed as they first appeared to be in that study and that's um a really nice thing about the equitation science society is that it's that sort of environment and that's what the conferences are for. You go along to the conference, you present your work and people say, oh, that, that's really interesting. Have you thought about trying this? Oh, that, yeah, that's a good idea. I should redo that and maybe, you know, try it from this angle or, yeah, perhaps we should also look at something over here that might be affecting the horse in another way. So it's a really collaborative environment and um, the horses benefit from this. Absolutely, the horses are the winners here, which is wonderful. The final one I wanted to talk about today was um, the spontaneous blink rate as a measure of equine stress. Now, we're that, you'll find that on page 50. Now, we're always looking for ways to measure equine stress. Now, so maybe stress isn't the best word, um, but blink rate is a really interesting one because if Anything where we don't have to touch the horse is going to be much easier for the horse and, you know, because it's less invasive. So before the gold standard for stress testing was always cortisol. Um, but, you know, you have to go in and swab their mouth and you have to send that off to have it tested. And, I'm like, oh, you know, and if you've got a horse like the unhandled horse is in the licking and chewing study, you can't do that. You can't go and swab their mouths because you can't touch them. Um, and this is also would be a really good way of finding out whether a horse was stressed, you know, just counting its blink rates um, in, say, let's say, in a sale environment, let's say a horse in a sale yard that you don't want to touch, but you could actually just um, video or you could count the blink rates there from a distance. So it's another thing a bit like um, taking the horse's eye temperature. And if you had a look at my... Um, the work we did with the nose bands when we were tightening up nose bands on horses one of the measures of stress we used there was um nose band was um excuse me eye temperature so we used the thermal camera and took a photograph of the horse's eye and you measure just this little bit in here where the tear duct is you you take the temperature there and when that goes up it's an indication of stress and so it's possible that the blink rate helps cool the eye um, and that might be why they blink but you know, that's that's also a really easy way for people to see whether their horse is stressed. So that was a great 
um, introduction there to that possibility of being able to in the future just look at blink rate and stress because not everybody has a thermal camera they cost a fortune um, and you know then you, you, you they're not as easy to use it as it is to count anyone can count um, but to be able to do that you know from a distance to see whether the horse was stressed or not might be really really useful so all in all, I thought the conference was fantastic. And, you know, I'm only up to, to page 30 out of 171. So there's lots more in here. Um, if you would like, we could do uh, a little bit more on this. Just let me know if there's anything in particular you'd like to talk about. Um, it was a great conference. And... Um, I'm happy to talk about some more of the things that we saw, but have, download your copy of the proceedings and have a look yourself. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments on the blog post and I'll get to them. And I hope to see you next year. Next year it's going to be in Canada, which will be fantastic in Guelph at the university. Um, and they are so organised, those Canadians, they're amazing. It's going to be amazing. They're already organised incredible i will certainly be there and i hope you will as well and for those of you in north america then it's going to be simple to get there i'm also hoping which i should um, give you a heads up now about i'm also hoping to do a series of clinics in the states and in canada before that conference so it's going to be oh gosh when is it going to be is it august the I think it's August the 19th, around August the 19th. So if you would like to um, book in some preliminary dates for a clinic near you, then just let me know. We'll do that. Anyway, I will see you next week. Oh, no, I won't because Monday's webinar next week is on Tuesday, I think. But anyway, I haven't got the registration up yet. So when I do check that registration, make sure Monday's webinar isn't on Tuesday. But if it is, I will see you next week on Tuesday for the webinar. Thanks for being here. Bye.